This is the second uh, of five lectures that make up the remote sensing basics uh, section of the course. And uh, we're going to talk about color. So we're going to talk about why there are three primary colors, um, what the wavelengths of those colors are, and how we visualize images of light wavelengths that are not visible to the human eye. So before we go any further, um, I want to um, point out that um, I understand that uh, some students may be colorblind. And um, I want to assure you that we always make the necessary uh, adjustments for students with colorblindness. You just need to send me an email and I will work with you and the TA to make sure that you can do all of the, the labs or we otherwise adjust for uh, your disability. Okay, so, um, you know, when we think about the remote sensing process, you know, we might think of uh, a satellite recording images that are beamed down to the earth there's some adjustment that's done, you know, and then the image is shown on your computer. But it's important to know that the, the human eye and brain are an integral part of the remote sensing process. To, to understand images, we need to understand how we interpret image information. Now, the human eye is capable of pattern recognition that we haven't been able to um, match with even the most significant or, or sophisticated, I should say, AI programs. Um, and you should hopefully be able to see that there's a dog in this picture. Um, but color vision is sort of fundamentally based on a lie that your, your eyes and your brain um, are telling you. The first thing to point out is the spectrum is continuous. That is, there is um, light continually varying as a function of wavelength, both in terms of the intensity of the light that you're seeing and in terms of the reflection of light. Um, there's no um, uh, classes of light um, fundamentally, okay? It's all smoothly varying. Now, you might think that the human eye directly um, observes uh, different colors. That would be a logical thing to uh, think. So if we look at this, um, this photo of a lotus, uh, we're looking at the yellow portion in the middle and if we took uh, an instrument, a, a spectroradiometer, and passed it over that portion, then what we would see is a reflection in the, um, the wavelengths of light around yellow. Um, and, you know, that's the, how the actual spectral characteristics of the, uh, the flower are distributed. OK, that's what's going on in the real world. And you might think, oh, well, you have your eyeball you've got your, uh, your retina in the back. And that sends some information that says yellow uh, to your brain. That is not what's happening. Um, and we know this isn't happening because you have no way of observing yellow light uh, in your in your eye. Um, in your eye for color vision, um, you have three kinds of receptors. You have uh, red receptors, green receptors, and blue receptors, okay? Um, and those are known as cones. And we can look at the sensitivity of each kind of cone. Um, the sensitivity for each is kind of broad. So what we call the blue cone is actually sensitive to violet light and blue light and mixtures of blue and green, that kind of light blue color that we refer to as cyan. Um, green cones 
are sensitive a little bit to cyan, a lot to the green and yellow, and then a little bit to the red. And the, the red cones are sensitive to green and yellow and red. And this overlap is going to turn out to be important. So these are, again, the sensitivities. And you can see uh, they all overlap. Also in here, um, there are rods. And rods are the cells in your eye that are sensitive for low light environments. We don't talk about the rods very much because we're interested in uh, rods are sort of broadly sensitive. You can see to like blue and green and, and yellow and they're not really involved with color vision as much. So we're not quite as interested. The important part to, to understand here is you can see um, on the x-axis, that's the wavelength of light. On the y-axis, that's the retinal response. And it's sort of just a, a percent of the maximum response. Um, the important thing to note here is the response of the cone is independent of the uh, the wavelength. So you're only going to get a certain electrochemical response. So blue cone, it's only giving off one value. And that value is a function of the wavelength that is being seen. OK? Um, if you have wavelengths coming in at like 450 nanometers, it's going to give you a very high result. If you have uh, light impinging upon the eye at like 550 nanometers, it's going to give you a dark result. So we have our um, we have our um, image there. Um, that image, that little okay, never mind. I'm going to edit this. So let's look at um, the influence of various kinds of light on the cones. And here we're looking at the, you know, the uh, excite excitement of each one of the cones as a function of um, various different colors. So um, violet is going to excite the, the blue cone a little bit. Um, so those numbers are, ex, you know, electrochemical response in blue, green, and red in that order. Um, blue is going to be cause excitement uh, on the blue cone, but not on the green and red. Cyan, which is that mixture of blue and green, um, that's going to give us some uh, excitement on blue and green and not red. Green is going to give us high excitement um, on both green and red. Orange um, is going to give us excitement on both um, a, a little more on the red than uh, the green. And then, you know, finally, red is going to give us um, excitement on just the red cone. So now we can answer our first question, which why are there three primary colors? And that's because we have three types of cones. Um, there are only three colors to be mixed. Um, and now, when we're looking at light and mixing of light, green and red make yellow. Why is that? It's because yellow activates green and red cones. Um, and so if you're you're mixing those two kinds of light, you're going to see yellow. Now, the diagram on the left shows you the various colors you get by mixing each one of the, the light primaries, red, green, and blue. Um, blue and green mixed together make cyan, and cyan is in between blue and green spectrally, so that makes sense. Green and red make yellow. And again, green and red, um, or yellow, is between green and red. Now, the tricky one here is blue and red. And um, 
those make a color called magenta, which looks almost like purple or violet, but in fact, uh, it's very different. And we'll talk about this separately. So how do I know that this is true? Well, we can find that this is true by looking at metamers. So metamers are different mixtures of light that excite the cones in the same way. So for instance, we might be looking at a case where light of 600 nanometers is um, being um, displayed to the eye. And again, that's going to excite the red and the green cones, and you're gonna see yellow. But we could also show light with a range of wavelengths. And between, say, 550 and 650 nanometers, that's also going to excite those two cones, and you're going to see the same color. Um, similarly, we can show two separate colors to your eyes, one that excites the green and one that excites the red, and you're going to see the exact same color. You're going to see yellow. And this is how uh, televisions and monitors work, okay? Um, your monitor does not generate every possible color. It generates red, green, and blue. And by varying the brightness of red, green, and blue, um, it can make your eye, can fool your eye into thinking it's looking at millions of colors. Uh, and this is because of the metamer principle. So here's another way to look at how various colors mix. This is a trinary diagram, right? So you're um, displaying three variables um, as um, that uh, add up to 100%. And so um, at the top, we have 100% green. At the bottom left, we have 100% blue. And then at the bottom right, we have 100% red. As we get toward the middle of the diagram, that's balanced red, green, and blue, and that is white. As we go to the right-hand side of the, um, the diagram, we have a 50-50 mix of green and red, yellow. Left side of the diagram in the middle, 50-50 mix of cyan, 50-50 uh, mix of blue and green, that's cyan, and at the bottom middle, we have a 50-50 mix of blue and red, and that's magenta. And that just gives you a sense for um, that diagram, how that mixing goes on and what the various colors are that you would see giving that kind of mixture. So again, this is the principle that makes possible TV. TVs display blue, green, and red light, and then your brain does the work of um, interpreting that as you know, all the colors of the rainbow plus magenta. So when we're thinking about remote sensing, we're thinking about um, how much light is being displayed in these three bands um, on a computer display. Um, and an additional level of abstraction is rather than displaying it as levels of brightness in blue, green, red, we can display them as grayscale, okay? So brightness and darkness in blue on the left bottom panel is just being shown as brightness and darkness in grayscale. Uh, the reason we do this is it allows us to consider visible and non-visible bands in the same way. So we can look at darkness versus brightness in red, or we can look at darkness versus brightness in the near infrared, uh, which obviously we can't display on a monitor. So, same three bands, I'm just kind of stacking them up here. Um, blue, green, and red grayscale images. They're a little light, but there are, there are arrows connecting um, each one of those bands to a monitor. And in this case, the blue band 
is being assigned to the blue display color. The green band is displayed as the green um, band on the monitor. And band three, the red band, is being displayed as red um, on the monitor. So this is a true color display. It's going to reproduce the original visible appearance of an image in the same way. Now, there's anything special about the true color assignment. Any band can be assigned to any color layer on the monitor. And in this case, we've assigned uh, blue to the red um, um, display color, green to the green display color, and red to the blue display color. We've swapped blue and red. And so instead of um, having that center portion show up as yellow, red and green, it shows up as cyan, blue and green. So this is a diagram that gives you um, sort of a, an entire overview of the image interpretation process. So at top, we're looking at, um, first of all, I've, I've labeled, in a sense, the portion of the spectrum that's visible, which is you know violet through red, then near infrared and mid infrared. Um, and these are keyed in by the wavelength at the bottom of that panel. Um, we'll look, talk about what portions of the, the spectra are affected by various vegetation characteristics. So here I've just shown the visible is sensitive to leaf pigments. The near IR is uh, sensitive to cellular structure. And the mid IR is sensitive to uh, leaf water content. Uh, and then we have the reflectance of two surface types. We're going to talk about this. We have some vegetation, uh, maple leaf, and some soil. And then we have these yellow bars in the panel just below that first panel. And it's labeled as ETM Plus. This is a particular sensor, the Enhanced Thematic Mapper Plus. And the yellow portions are the bands of that particular sensor. So there's a blue band, a green band, a red band, um, a near infrared band, and then two mid infrared bands. And so in this case, this is a true color image. The uh, red band is assigned to the red display. The green band is associated with the green display. And the blue band is associated with the blue display. Okay, so that gives you a true color image. In this case, this is the local. Landsat image, and you'll see this a bunch of times. Um, but true color is not necessarily what we want to be using when we're examining images. Another common type of image that we use is a color infrared image. And in this image, the blue that we're seeing is actually the green band that was recorded by the sensor. So we're swapping the green band and displaying it as blue. Similarly, the red band is being displayed as green and the near infrared band is being shown as red. And so all the areas you see that are red have high um, reflectance in um, the near infrared. Near infrared, as you can see in the diagram above, um, there's high reflectance of vegetation in the near infrared. So everything you're seeing that's red in that image is actually bright in near infrared. Uh, this is a um, uh, band combination that's sensitive to differences in geology. And so in this case, red is displayed as green Near infrared is displayed as blue, and mid infrared, which is very sensitive to differences in geology, is displayed as red. We can also display things as grayscale. So in this case, we're, we've got an equation that we're calculating. So this is 
the equation is for the index NDVI, that's Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and we'll talk about this further along. Um, it's an index that tells you how green things are. And what it uses is the contrast between infrared and red, because infrared is bright um, in cases where you have vegetation, and red is dark. And so you have infrared minus red, that difference is gonna be greater the more vegetation there is. And then you divide by infrared plus red to correct for overall brightness. So then we calculate NDVI, and we have assigned that to all three color guns, red, green, and blue. And so the higher the value, the brighter the grayscale, darker the value, lower. We can also use pseudo color lookups. So for instance, we can calculate the NDVI and we can assign different colors based on that value. So the colors here are not meaningful in and of themselves. Um, it's the lookup table that's being observed. So if you have a value of zero, it's gonna be displayed as purplish. Um, if you have a little higher value, it'll be blue, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to red. Um, and so that just allows you to distinguish levels of NDVI uh, uh, with greater precision. This is a set of indices, three indices, known as the tassel cap indices. So in this case, you're not looking at, at spectral data uh, directly, you're looking at different weightings of each band um, that are then assigned to um the three color guns uh, or uh, display colors so important part here is um, if we have what we refer to as multi-spectral imagery where we have multiple bands being recorded by the sensor um, you can display different wavelengths in different combinations to highlight different features. So um, we had the green before, now we have the color infrared. And now we can switch this again and look at bands that are going to distinguish, in this case, um, um, water features and um, agricultural features. So, summarize, um, cones are sensitive to three primary colors. Uh, remote sensing can detect brightnesses of different wavelengths of light. And then you can combine um, three primary colors, red, green, blue in an image to produce a true color image, but you can use other combinations of wavelengths so that you can visualize different features of the land surface.